Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Um, first, let me introduce myself. I, as the pastor said, I'm from Jamaica, the land of the reggae, as some of you may know. <laughs> and also the land of the sprinters. Um, um, uh, you, the Kenyans, are noted for your long-distance runners. We are noted for the sprinters, like Usain Bolt, for example, Shelley Ann Fraser, Sharika Jackson, Elaine Thompson. We could make quite a list of them. And um, I'm married to a beautiful Belizean girl, yes, who is here with me today. We have four offsprings, four children, including a set of triplets, by the way. <laughs> yes, and this year, it's been 50 years since we've said, I do. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, this trip is a gift from our firstborn son um, to celebrate that very thing, our 50th anniversary. I was saved as a young man at university some 63 years ago. And uh, I have been a science teacher for most of my working years. I have also been a high school principal in Jamaica and also in Belize, uh, where I have been living for the past 40 or so years, almost 40. And since 1971 to the present time, I have been an elder in a local church. I want to say too, before I begin my message this morning, how much I have been um, how much I have enjoyed being here in Kenya. I love your people. As a matter of fact, my ancestors are from Africa. And um, so for that reason, I'm one with you. I'm one of you. Amen. Um, I also love your singing especially in Swahili. Mark you, I don't understand a word of Swahili. <laughs> but you sing with such feeling and with such emotion that I can't help, that, um, I can't help but be stirred. Um, for, for this reason, it's not a bit surprising to me that the congregation here refuse to, be, to keep still. You all move and sway with the music um, as it is being sung. Um, and now to the message. And in keeping with the... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to get this as far as from here. Let's give me a moment. Oh, I think it's all right. I think it's all right now. Yeah. Yes, in keeping with the theme. I want to share with you this morning how I came to love the Bible. Thereafter, I will speak to the matter of changing belief, because as you know, the theme is love the Bible, change Africa, not believe. That's a slip of the tongue. My text is taken from Psalm 119 and verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. The word law, 
as used here, refers not just to the Ten Commandments, but to all of Scripture. The psalmist is expressing his love <clears throat> for all God's word. Now, in Psalm 19, 100, um, I'm sorry, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 7 to 8, we read that our Lord asked the multitude of people around him the following questions concerning John the Baptist. What went you out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Indeed, those who wear soft raiment are in king's houses. It seems to me, from the nature of the Lord's questions, that he discerned that the people saw John the Baptist, um, that when the people, rather, saw John the Baptist clothed in Clamel's hair, and a leather belt about his waist, they were either disillusioned or disappointed. By the same token, if I were to tell you that when I got saved as a young man, I saw no light from heaven, I heard no strange sounds, I felt no special warmth over my body or down my arms. I did not feel, I did not fall to the ground or pass out, or as someone, as some people in Jamaica would say, I just gone from myself. I didn't know what happened to me. Nothing like that at all. Um, you, if I said all that, some of you may well be disappointed to hear that I didn't. Because for some strange reason, people generally seem to delight in hearing the sensational in testimonies. Many even think that these things are a part of the salvation experience. I go further. When I did pray the quote-unquote sinner's prayer, I was sitting on the edge of the bed. I um, actually expected to experience these things. And when they did not occur, I thought that I had not adopted the right posture. So I got up from the bed and I knelt by the bedside and prayed as sincerely as I could. And what do you think happened? Nothing. Nothing. Was I saved then? Yes, I was. And how did I know? Because the Holy Spirit of God graciously showed me from the scriptures a few days later that a person is saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2 and 8. Faith in what the Lord Jesus did at Calvary almost 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit taught me that we all become children of God through simple faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 and verse 26. Um, here again, there is no mention of feeling, nor of explanations for that matter. We don't have to know how a person's life can be so dramatically altered um, just by believing in the finished work of Christ 
on the cross. Indeed, as the scriptures declare in Deuteronomy 26, or rather 29 and verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. God doesn't, um, God never reveals everything to us. No. In fact, he's not obligated to explain anything. We, in turn, must live in the light of what we know. That is what has been revealed to us. So when the word of God says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, Acts 16, 31, just believe and you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Now, guided by the Spirit of God, who, by the way, is the one who guides us into all truth, according to John 16, 13. While I was reading through the entire New Testament and listening to gospel messages over the radio, um, the Holy Spirit put it together for me that, one, I was a sinner, bound for hell, I could not save myself. The Lord Jesus Christ was the only Savior from the awful penalty for my sins. Their power in this life and one day to come, their very presence. By inviting him, him that is the Lord Jesus, into my heart and life, I would be saved. Amen? Amen. Everyone who is truly born again, who is saved, must accept all these things. Must. Yes. Now, looking back at my own conversion, now, brother, would you, there's a bottle at the, um, behind the chair there on the ground. Would you pass it for me, please? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Looking back at my own conversion, I'm genuinely glad that I did not have these experiences because I would probably be expecting the same or similar experiences throughout my Christian life. I would probably be probably go into depression or doubt um, if they did not come. And because I had not um, realized the importance of faith in the revealed word of God. Feelings come and feelings go. We can't depend upon them. No. And in the same way that the word informed me that I became a child of God through faith in the Son of God, it also taught me that the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17. The word just here um, refers to those who have been placed in right standing with God. They, that is the just, live by faith not feeling, nor explanations. And if we are to live a victorious and vibrant, sanctified life, we must, um, as one brother shared with us on Thursday, 
We must continue as babes to desire the milk of the word of God that we may grow thereby. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Um, we must be putting our faith in the ability of that word to sanctify us or to set us apart unto the holiness that God desires to see in us. Sanctify them by your truth, says the Lord Jesus in his prayer in John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 17. Your word is truth. That's how we are sanctified, by the word of God. We're set apart unto holiness. And it was from those early days that I developed a love for and a trust in the word of God, the Bible. And it was well that I should because it provided a firm foundation for me. A firm foundation in all matters spiritual. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven, established and secured permanently. It will never change. And that is why the word of God, the Bible, provides a foundation for everyone's life. Amen. Um, as another of our brother um, reminded us on Thursday from Psalm 19, the word of God is perfect, converting the soul. It makes wise the simple. It brings joy to the hearts. It enlightens the eyes. It warms us, warns us, and we receive great reward from keeping it. That's all in Psalm, um, Psalm 19. Hiding it in our hearts keeps us from sin. Psalm 119 verse 11. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Psalm 19, verse 105, giving us all the direction, the guidance that we need. And oh, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> but I trust by now you will see why I love the Bible. Amen? Amen. Before I close off this section at how I came to love the Bible, I certainly do not want you to get me wrong. It's not that our feelings do not change when we come to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior. Matter of fact, I shed tears of gratitude then and now, even now, when I consider that God has saved me and that now I am heaven bound. Amen. We read in Acts chapter 8 that the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing after he was saved. All right? And a lady whom I led to the Lord many, many, many years ago, told me that um, she woke up the morning feeling so light following the, um, following the, her coming to know the Lord um, the previous day as her savior. She, sell, she said she felt as if a huge burden has been lifted off her shoulders. And we know, don't we, 
that that was the burden of sin that we all bore before we, um, before that glorious day when we came to lay it down at the foot of the cross. Would any one of you this morning, or this, after, this morning really, wish to be free of your burden of sins? There's power in the blood. There is power in the blood that Christ shed for you on the cross. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. There is wonderful power in the blood. Amen. Now, to the matter of changing beliefs. When an individual, just a moment, <clears throat> when an individual comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, when he becomes a Christian, the Bible says that he has been reconciled to God. That is, he has been restored to a right relationship with God with whom he had been at enmity. He had been at war. Yes, that is so. Um, <clears throat> Just a moment. That restoration of fellowship was achieved by God the Father being in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That work was all of God and none of us. It was all God's work. And because God knows that if that individual, as a matter of fact, any individual, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, all things are passed away, and all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He, God, has committed to that man, that saved individual, the ministry or the work of reconciliation. The work of leading others to be reconciled to him through faith in Jesus Christ. You want to read all about this? Just go into 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at your leisure, not now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. It follows then that if Africa is to be changed morally and spiritually, it must be by the word of God, the Bible, taken to them by the children of God, specifically um, the children of God must take to the peoples of Africa the gospel, the good news of how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again according to the scriptures. I'm surprised that someone many years ago in a little Bible study I had said, I didn't know that that was the gospel, and he professed to be saved. Or perhaps he also said, didn't you know that was in the Bible? Yes, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. It tells you expressly what is the gospel by which we are saved. And why specifically the gospel? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone who believes, Romans 1 and verse 16. In other words, the gospel is the power.
powerful tool, the agent that um, uses, that God uses to bring salvation or deliverance, because that's what salvation means, um, on a personal or a national level. And a, a person, uh, sorry, a, a, bring salvation or deliverance on a personal or a national level um, to be free from the penalty of his sins, the power of sin, and as I've said before, one day from the very presence of sins. So then what's our responsibility? Like the Apostle Paul, we should consider ourselves as debtors. Debtors, the E-B-T-O-R-S. Because God has given us this ministry or this work of reconciliation. In other words, you and I who are born again, who are Christians, have an obligation to bring the gospel to all of Africa. An obligation Indeed, to the whole world. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are not free from that debt until we have told as many as possible, as much that, it, that, life, in, that life in us, as many as possible, the good news of salvation. Those of us who cannot literally take the gospel, can pray in the light of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that the word of God may have, quote unquote, free course. Literally, this means that the word of God may so run that all obstacles to its progress might be removed, that we may be able to keep the pace that is required for us to get the message out before the Lord's soon return. And it is soon. I do believe that. He'll be coming soon. Amen. We should pray for those who go that God may open a door for, their, for them with this message, for his message, and that they may proclaim it clearly in a way that can be understood, give them the sense, as I think Ezra did in days of old to the people who were gathered beneath him. This we see in Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. Yes. We should also pray that the law, that the word may fall on fertile, the fertile ground of man's soul. And that those who hear and understand the word is one thing to hear, another thing to understand. Those who hear and understand the word may bear fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, but bear fruit. I think that's what our Lord Jesus said in John's Gospel chapter 16. I have chosen you that you may bear fruit. And of course, those of us who have the means, by the way, that bit about bearing fruit is found in the uh, parable of the sower, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Um, of course, those of us who have the means to do so can give to the cause. The Macedonians, as the Macedonians gave to the um, to materially assist the poor in the church so we can give to the cause of missions. The Macedonians actually gave out of their quote-unquote deep poverty. In other words, you don't have to be rich to give. You don't have to have more than enough. <laughs> you give out of what you have. They gave out of their deep poverty voluntarily and spontaneously because they had experienced 
the grace of God that freed them from their sins. That self-same grace had not only opened their hearts, but opened their hands. Some of us are tight-fisted when it comes to the money, aren't we? Yes, it opened their hands as well. After they had first given themselves to God in consecration, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 9, to determine his will on the matter of giving. What better example could we have than the Macedonians? In closing, I'd just like to exhort you, love the Bible, change Africa. Amen. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that your word might find a resting place in every heart this morning and that by it many may be transformed into the likeness, to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.